Welcome back, I'm Mr. Sensible. Recently, Mrs. Sensible and I went for a few days away to a rather nice hotel buried in the countryside. And what do you do when you've got a few days alone together in a rather nice hotel in the countryside? You end up thinking about flat earth. I think there's something wrong with my life. Anyway, before I tell you about this, some quick thanks to all my lovely patrons. With massive thanks to all my patrons, including new patrons Alice Vangstrom, John Roswell, Tech Blog, Pyro Kitty Cat, Claire Johnson, Mr. Victory, and Brian A. Shannon, and my latest patrons Pi Parrot, Gunnar Olson, and Sean White. Thank you all so very much. I think it's best if I just show you what I filmed, and you'll soon understand why I was thinking of flat earthers. Roll VT. In January, Mrs. Sensible and I had a few days away at a place called Slebich Park Hotel. Absolutely beautiful it was, and set in a lovely, lovely piece of countryside. I thought I'd show you a couple of things because during my stay, I kept thinking of flat earthers. So you may be thinking, why on earth, Mr. Sensible, would you be thinking about flat earthers? when you've got lovely, gorgeous views like this? Well, the answer is the river itself. As you can see, the water is like glass, an absolute and beautiful mirror. But there was something that I had read in the notes that you get in a hotel room about the local area that just made me think, I've got to film this. When I told Mrs. Sensible I was going to do some filming for a video, she wasn't best pleased. But at least she's got this footage to remind her of our few days away, because it is gorgeous. Now this filming was taken just before a most excellent breakfast, and I'd like you to take careful note of the water and where it's sitting in relation to the banks and the grass, especially against that island over there. Got that? Good, because this is less than two hours later after breakfast and for some reason the river has dropped. Look at that exposed mud against that tiny little island right in front of you. And now, as we see the bigger island, you can see an exposed beach of mud because the river level has dropped. Slebech is on a tidal estuary. Being as this is all for science, we'd have to repeat the observation. So I spent a couple of hours in the jacuzzi contemplating this before coming back out and filming again. And the river has all but gone. It has dropped an amazing amount. Here at Slebich, it drops by 14 feet with each tidal change. Here's a slightly different view, showing that the tributary is now little more than a stream. Finally, here's a pan across the main river. As I said, here the tidal range is about 14 feet. We're not a million miles away from the Severn Estuary, which has a 15 metre, that's 50 feet, tidal range, the largest in the world. Oh, hello, Mrs. Sensible. So what happens is as you get a high tide, the water backs up up the estuary and the level of the river rises. And of course, as the tide goes out, the level of the river drops. We typically see a diagram for tides like this. We get two high and low tides a day as the earth rotates. The tide is caused by the moon and to a lesser extent by the sun. But let's ignore the sun for now. So with the gravitational pull of the moon on the Earth's seas, we get a high tide, a bulge on the moonward side of the Earth. And at roughly 90 degrees, we get low tides. But as we know, we get the second high tide on the side of the Earth directly opposite from the moon. This is a little harder to explain and understand. The moon doesn't strictly orbit the Earth. The Earth and moon both orbit their shared barycenter, the chequered little circle in the middle. Think of an athlete 
spinning round and about to throw the hammer in the Olympics is the same sort of thing. When you sum up all the gravitational effects of the moon, the earth itself and the sun, what you get is those little white arrows, the tidal vectors. And as you can see, it's quite obvious why you get too low and too high tides. However, it's not important for this video. The point is just that you get a high tide on the side facing the moon and a high tide on the face opposite. So that's the established science. Two high tides and two low tides each day. Let's try mapping it out. Here is a rectangular projection of the globe Earth. You get quite a bit of distortion at the top and the bottom by the poles, but across at the equator there's virtually none, and that's where we're going to work. So we'll start 80 degrees west, roughly off the coast of Ecuador, near the equator, and we'll mark up the high tide area. Next we'll go to the exact opposite side of the world, again by the equator, at around 100 degrees east off the coast of Sumatra, and mark that up as the other high tide area. Now we'll look at the low tide areas. So roughly 90 degrees from Ecuador and 90 degrees from Sumatra is approximately 10 degrees east, somewhere in the region of the Gulf of Guinea, so we'll mark that up as well. And the final low tide area, 180 degrees from the Gulf of Guinea, is somewhere in the area just south of the Marshall Islands at 170 degrees west. Well, that's all just fine and dandy and tickety-boo. Let's transcribe that onto a flat earth map. But of course, there is no flat earth map. However, this one is usually a most widely regarded as a fair representation of a flat earth. So we'll go with this one. So just like we did before, we'll put in our high tide areas, starting with 80 degrees west, off the coast of Ecuador. Now 100 degrees east again, off the coast of Sumatra. And then our two low tide areas, starting with around 10 degrees east, off the Gulf of Guinea. And 170 degrees west, again just south of the Marshall Islands. Brilliant. So how can this be explained? Let's look again at the globe Earth projection map we've just constructed. So we have our two high tide areas, each 180 degrees apart, and our two low tide areas, also each 180 degrees apart. And as we know, we've got the tidal vectors, which are explaining it, that are caused by the gravitational pull of the moon. So let's add the moon to the map. Very nice. So we've got Ecuador, that's got the moon causing its high tides, and Sumatra has the tidal vectors on the opposite side of the Earth from the moon, causing its high tides. The other two areas, obviously, being the low tide areas. So let's return to the flat Earth map we constructed. So taking Ecuador on the left, being one high tide area, why should Sumatra, just across a flat disk, also have a high tide? Why should there be two low tides opposite each other? Silly old me. I forgot the moon. So let's add that over Ecuador again. We still have a problem though. That explains why there's a high tide in Ecuador. But why Sumatra? What could be the cause across a plain where there is no moon above? What could be the cause of a high tide there? Well, I guess that some flat earther will come up with an equivalent to the tidal vectors. Some fancy maths, some pretty arrows, and that will explain it. There's a big problem though. You guys don't believe in gravity. Once again, science and reality match. We have gravity, and it explains the tides. But as you flat earthers don't have gravity, how do you explain those tides? That's a challenge for you, and I look forward to a video explaining it. Hope you've enjoyed. Look forward to seeing you again next time. Until then, stay sensible. Shut up and sit down.